Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Tel Aviv. Coming up in today's newscast, Christians unite to save Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem. California looks to Israel for inspiration to fight eating disorders, and you won't believe how far Israel is going to save a refugee's life. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. Israel is stepping up its defensive construction work along the Lebanese border. Bulldozers are hard at work in an effort to strengthen the country's frontier and protect Israeli communities from possible infiltrators. If you're wondering why the Israeli army says it's preparing for a possible war with Hezbollah. We are seeing a part of a project called Irgun Amerchav. The project of לאורך כל הגליל. חלק מהתפקיד של הפרויקט הזה זה לתת מענה לתוכניות של חיזבאללה ללחימה הבאה. The IDF Lieutenant General Eli David says a construction has started near the town of Shlomi, which is a good example of an Israeli community under threat. Shlomi is right on the border of Lebanon, but a 10-meter cliff now surrounds a nearby Lebanese village of Hanita, making it much harder for unwanted infiltrators to cross into Israel. Local residents say that they now feel much safer. Since the end of the second Lebanon war in 2006, Israel and Hezbollah have avoided a large-scale confrontation along their 50-mile frontier. But Hezbollah terrorist leader Hassan Nasrallah regularly threatens Israel, and a future confrontation is not a question of if, but rather of when. You probably know that Jesus' tomb is said to be inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. What you might not know is that rivaling Christian factions constantly fight over it, but now they're coming together to save it from falling apart. The Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, and Roman Catholic groups are notorious for disagreeing with each other over the church, which sometimes leads to violence. In 2008, monks and priests even brawled near the shrine where Jesus' tomb is said to be. But it looks like the groups have finally found some common ground, and they're coming together to renovate the shrine and keep it from collapsing. They signed an agreement in March that will give $3.4 million to renovate the historic shrine. Each group will cover a third of the costs, which will go to taking the marble shell apart piece by piece to clean it, as well as cleaning the shrine itself and repairing cracks in the tomb. The last significant renovation was in the 1950s, and the newest project should go a long way to cleaning and maintaining the shrine and tomb. And if you're thinking of visiting, don't worry. The church and shrine will still be open to visitors during most of the renovations. Have you ever heard of a kibbutz before? These special collective communities are unique to Israel and have traditionally been based on agriculture. Kibbutz members live according to socialist rules, sharing everything and working for the same pay no matter what kind of labor they're doing. Today there are only around 270 of these utopian communities in Israel, but now they're becoming global powerhouses and you'll want to know why. Farming is no longer the main source of income for many Israeli kibbutzes. Instead, many kibbutzes have come up with successful technologies and products that are making tons of money. So while kibbutz members were once socialist farmers, there are many who are now becoming quite wealthy. Take kibbutz Chazarim as an example. The community in southern Israel is now world famous for its company Netafim, which is responsible for inventing the well-known drip irrigation technique that is helping countries around the world conserve water and save money. Kibbutz Chatzerim sold Netafim to a German investment group in 2011, raking in almost $1 billion for its community members. And how about Kibbutz Shamir near the Sea of Galilee? The pastoral kibbutz founded Shamir Optical, which is one of the world's only manufacturers of multifocal lenses for eyeglasses, thanks to its groundbreaking technology. And if you've ever swam in a pool before, you've probably seen those funny robots that clean swimming pools. But you might not know that one-third of them come from Kibbutz Yisrael in northern Israel, which founded Matronics. 
The company is now worth over $1 billion, and its socialist kibbutz leaders can probably feel the community funds growing bigger. These are only three of many incredibly successful kibbutzes throughout Israel that have become global powerhouses. And while they may continue to remain collective communities, many more kibbutzes are embracing Israel's reputation as a high-tech nation. Udi Pellet is the head of the successful kibbutz Ramat Yohanan in northern Israel, and he's here in the studio with us. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. So let's go back to the basics. Can you explain what a kibbutz is to our viewers who aren't really familiar with the movement? Well, you know, the kibbutzim movement started in 1910, it's, uh, 106 years ago, in Degania, which is a small kibbutz in the Jordan Valley near the Sea of Galilee. Since then, most of the kibbutzim were uh, born before the state of Israel, before 48. Since then, there is 278 kibbutzim, which accounts to about less than 2% of the Israeli population, about 160,000 um, population. Members is less, but including children, everybody. Kibbutzim started with agriculture, but in the 60s of last century, the Industrial Revolution came to the kibbutzim. At that time, polymers, polystyrene, polypropylene, polyethylene, all this was new materials, and actually this was high-tech at that time. And also the industrial process was uh, a lot of automatization and this was very good for the kibbutzim because they didn't want to employ a lot of salarians from outside to exploit uh, the work of other people. So most of the plastics industry in Israel today is held by the kibbutzim, including in my kibbutz in uh, Palram. And so everybody shares the land and works for the same pay no matter what they do, which is very different uh, than the capitalistic life that you typically see in Israel, right? Well, you know, this is right for the traditional kibbutz. Today, out of the 278 kibbutzim, there's about 60 kibbutzim which are still traditional kibbutz, like Ramat Yohanan. Other kibbutzim have already undergone some changes. One of the major changes is that in a lot of kibbutzim in Israel today, your earnings is yours. Still, you have to pay quite heavy uh, taxes to the municipality or to the community, actually, in order to finance for infrastructure, for education. Uh, so a lot of equal services for all members, no matter what is the earnings, but still, great part of your earning is yours today. In Ramat Yochanan, which right. is still a traditional kibbutz, we are still living by the motto which says everybody contributes as much as he can and receives from community as much as he needs. And this is not, there is no correlation, of course, because when you're young and able, you can contribute a lot. When you are old, sick maybe, still you get like everybody. So everybody gets the same budget. Doesn't matter if you are the chairman or the CEO of the factory or any other job in the kibbutz or outside the kibbutz, because there is about 100 people, 100 members, which work outside the kibbutz and bring salaries to the communal cash. So it's very interesting for people who aren't uh, accustomed to this type of life. You know, if you're making the same pay no matter what you do, if you're head of the kibbutz or if you're working in the laundry room, how do people stay motivated? What is the motivation? Do you go to university? Are you still interested in going to university even if you know uh, you have this financial backing constantly? Well, when the kibbutz started, the kibbutz movement started, there was no much uh, assets, no much wealth, so there's no, not so much to share. Today, it's a little bit problematic. For me, I was born 70 years ago in the kibbutz. For me, it's natural. My motivation is not coming from money. My motivation is coming from con contributing to society, uh, social recognition, family, whatever you want, not money, because nobody judges me by money. If you go, for example, in Israel, you go to Miluim sometimes, on the first day, somebody comes with a big uh, Mercedes or something, I say, I'm a lawyer, I'm some advocate. Miluim is army uh, reserves. Yeah, yeah, but after 10 there. days, when you are there in the mud, and you are there, they don't know who, who you are, it doesn't matter. In the first day, you came with a very big car, you have a, you have a lot of money, you live in a very nice neighborhood, but we don't know who you are, because when it became a little bit difficult for everybody, we know who helped other people, who is my, oh, my real friend. In the kibbutz, we are born and die, more or less in the same neighborhood. So we know a lot, all the people, we know most of the people for all our lives. So I know you, who you are. It doesn't matter if you make an earning or you inherited a fortune or won it in the lottery, or even if you're able. I know you for so many years, so I don't appreciate you by your money. I appreciate you by your personality. So this motivation still exists, which is what's so this beautiful. This is internal motor. It's not by external um, money motivation. Right. By the way, uh, it is proven that also in the capitalistic world, money is not in the first degree for motivation. Right. So Kibbutz Ramad Yohanan also has a leading international plastic company. Right. And we spoke about this before. There are lots of kibbutzim that have these amazing uh, new companies or global powerhouses. Why are so many kibbutzim creating such successful businesses? 
Well, this is very difficult to explain, but I would say, for example, because we know each other for so many years and we live, we are neighbors and we are a big family, we cannot have, for example, uh, uh, confrontations on a big scale because I cannot tell you go to my friend, go to hell because next day in the children garden we have to sit together with our children. So there is no big conflict, we have to solve the conflicts. Right. Well, for example, this is a strength. Yeah, we have absolutely. to solve conflicts by compromise. It's interesting. And so even with all this money coming in, you don't think that that's going to influence the future of the kibbutzim? Are they going to stay together or are they going to privatize? Well, first of all, as I said before, about uh, among the 278, uh, only 60 is traditional kibbutz. But you know, the kibbutzim movement is built on four stories. There is the kibbutz and the kibbutz economy. Let's uh, take it from the economical side. Kibbutz economy, like the factory, and there is the regional organization in which we have the factory which, is, which belongs to some kibbutzim of the, of, of the region, and then there is the national enterprises, insurance company, other things, and then there's the kibbutzim movement, which represents us for um, government, inside and outside. So the kibbutz economy is built on a, it's not the kibbutz on its own. The kibbutz is part also of a kibbutzim movement and the region, and this gives also, this is also a point of strength. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Israel has long been a leader in fighting eating disorders among women and especially fashion models. In 2013, Israel passed a historical law to fight eating disorders in the fashion world by requiring that models have a body mass index of at least 18.5. Now it looks like Israel has inspired the United States because officials in California are about to pass a similar law. California has introduced a new law aimed at reducing eating disorders among models, and it just cleared its first legislative hurdle on Wednesday. According to the law, fashion models who want to work in California would need a doctor to test that they're of healthy weight and that they're not suffering from an eating disorder. Plus, it would require the state to not only develop health standards for models, but also regard them as employees of the brands they represent. This gives fashion models all the protections available to workers in California. This includes workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, disability insurance, and protections against harassment and discrimination. Eating disorders like anorexia nervosa are all too common among models around the world, many of whom are constantly pressured to lose weight or lose their jobs. The modeling industry is poorly regulated. During my career, I encountered bullying from agents and other professionals, and there was a sexual harassment, rape, and I was exposed to enormous amounts of drugs and alcohol, had payments withheld beyond the legal periods, or was never paid at all and was pressured to lose so much weight that I eventually developed anorexia nervosa and had to exit the industry due to my illness in 2012. Israel has been ahead of the curve when it comes to fighting eating disorders in the fashion world. In March 2012, Israeli lawmakers adopted legislation to require models to have a body mass index of at least 18.5 or forfeit a career in the fashion industry. The law also came to be known as the Photoshop Law internationally because it demands brands to make a special note on their ads if any computer-generated changes have been made to make models look thinner. Although the law targets all adults, it's clearly aimed at female models, since eating disorders mostly affect young women. In what is ostensibly an unregulated industry, pressures to engage in risky behavior are all too real. And by risky behavior, I mean starvation dieting, forfeiting compulsory schooling, and giving in to sexual demands from powerful male agents and clients. For many young models working today, bowing to these pressures can feel less like a choice than a prerequisite for employment. The well-known Israeli Photoshop law was passed after Israeli fashion photographer Adi Balkan was inspired to initiate the legislation. His motivation came from Hila El Maliach, an anorexic friend and model who weighed just 60 pounds when she died in 2007. Her tragic death led a massive campaign against the fashion industry to regulate the health of models. And since then, models around the world have started to speak out about the harsh realities of the industry. This impossible to maintain diet continued when I worked in Tokyo, Japan at 16. There, my only fuel for upwards of a 22 hour day was a hard boiled egg and plain yogurt. It was impossible to maintain this diet, but my agency continued to place pressure on me to maintain my slim physique. Eventually, though, my body gave in. One day in particular, 
After sleeping for only three hours, I fainted on set. It looks like Israel's hard work to protect female models has had an impact on the rest of the world. Last spring, France banned excessive thinness among models, and countries like Italy and Spain now rely on voluntary codes of conduct to protect models. California is just the next state to get on board. And if the state's new law passes, it has the potential to help many of the 40% of fashion models who suffer from eating disorders. Countless Syrian civilians have been injured in the country's civil war, and Israel has been helping treat injured Syrians since the start of the conflict. Now it looks like one special five-year-old refugee is bringing Israeli doctors and spies together, all in an effort to save her life. This particular five-year-old arrived in Israel after sustaining serious injuries when she was accidentally caught in a firefight between rival groups. The little girl was taken to a hospital in Haifa for treatment, and after her wounds had nearly healed, something devastating happened. Her Israeli doctors realized she has cancer. They of course couldn't let her go without treating the cancer, and began the search for a bone marrow donor. Now this is where the story gets crazy. In the little girl's case, they needed a relative to be the donor, which is how Israeli security services got involved. Israeli spies planned a secret mission to smuggle the five-year-old's family member in from an enemy country, who finally arrived on Monday. The little girl and her relative are now both quarantined in the hospital, and she's supposed to undergo her first round of cancer treatment this month. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. It's Thursday, which means it's the end of the work week in Israel. So today we're going to teach you the popular phrase sof aderech, which literally means the end of the road in Hebrew. Israelis like to use a popular phrase to refer to something great or really good. If you ask an Israeli how her trip to Greece was and she says sofa derech, she's trying to say she had an amazing time. It's like saying her trip was so good it couldn't get any better, just like how at the end of the road you can't go any farther. Make sense? Okay, let's practice using sofa derech. If I bake a cake and I bring it to the studio, what do I want to hear from my coworkers after they taste it? Sofa derech. If an Israeli asks you about your experience at your favorite restaurant in Tel Aviv, what do you say? Sofa derech. Israelis are passionate people and they love to emphasize how they feel, so don't be surprised if you hear Israelis using sofa derech to describe everything they like. If you figure out how to master using sofa derech, you'll not only sound super Israeli, you'll also impress your Israeli friends. On that note, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. The weekend is finally here. Friday is expected to be mostly sunny with a high of 83 degrees. Saturday should be partly cloudy, but the temperature will jump up to 92, so put on some sunscreen. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.79 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to check out our next update every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching and we'll see you tonight.